Well, I'm joined now by Dr. Jordan Peterson. Uh, Jordan, great to have you back on the program. A lot has happened since you were last on just a few weeks ago. Uh, I want to start by saying that I, I'm wrestling with a lot of moral quandaries about this war. And I'm hoping that through our conversation today, we might get to at least have some clarity about the moral quandaries and see if we can mm -hmm. uh, work out what we should be thinking about this, because I think it's very complicated um, and it's got to be nuanced, this conversation. D do you feel any moral quandaries about it? Well, I don't think you can have a war without moral quandary. I mean, a war is the consequence of an unsolvable moral quandary. And so uh, it's not surprising that the conversation surrounding the war is full of moral quandaries, because if, if it was straightforward and simple, and if there was an easy path forward, then there wouldn't be a war. And so, I mean, I'm, I can tell you what I think is going on to the degree that you can reduce it to something quickly explicable. You know, I think Iran is desperate because of the tenuous hold on power that the mullahs now have in Iran, given their own citizens' rebellion. I think they see the Abraham Accords, which were the most significant step forward towards peace in the Middle East for like 75 years. They see the Abraham Accords as an existential threat. This is a last-ditch attempt by the Iranian mullahs to use the Islam against Jews story to prop up their own dismal reign. And so they rattled the chain of their Hamas puppets and said, provoke, and they did. And their hope is that the Israeli response will be so overwhelming that the Arab world turns against them and maybe even the people who might be inclined to you know, be swayed by a victim narrative in the West and that the Abraham Accords will fall apart and, and that'll be the end of that. And that could happen and I'm hoping it won't because I think the Abraham Accords were, you know, and it, it's irritating to me for whatever, you, you know, utility that is, is that I think I know, insofar as you can know such things, that Saudi Arabia would have signed the Abraham Accords two years ago if Biden would have moved a little bit more forthrightly on it. And I think the reason that he didn't and the Democrats didn't was because they didn't want to give Trump any credit for anything that he had attained in his administration. And I think all of that is appalling. And, you know, I see this story of Muslim against Jew being put forward in this propagandistic manner. And I think, well, the Muslim world has to make a choice too, because it doesn't look to me like their proper champions are, is the government in Iran you know, and, 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 and it's not like the Saudis don't have their flaws and perhaps the rest of the Arab governmental structures, but the, the Islam world should move in the direction of the Abraham Accords. That would be great for everyone. We could have a real peace. We could have something approximating a union of the Abrahamic people, and I think the accord was named extraordinarily well. Or we could have what we've had for the last 75 years with the Palestinians as perpetual cannon fodder, you know, at the beck and call of those for whom having them be cannon fodder is useful. And so, yeah, well, there's just moral quandaries everywhere there. It's a minefield, but that's what I think is the, the fundamental reality of the current situation. It's a propaganda war, and there's a lot at stake. On October the 7th, Hamas obviously committed a, a terror attack of appalling magnitude. Where were you when you first heard about it? And what was your instant feeling about it? Well, my instant feeling was to be sickened by it. You know, and it hasn't been that long since I was in Jerusalem. And so it was a little closer to me than it might have otherwise been. Um, I'm also more sensitive to any signs of anti-Semitic catastrophe from studying the Holocaust for the length of time that I did and I've always regarded Jews as the canary in the coal mine and I think the reason that the Jews are the canary in the coal mine is because they're a successful minority you know and if a, if a culture can tolerate a successful minority it's pretty damn robust and it's not very resentful and as soon as a culture starts to get resentful the Jews make an easy target 
because they're a minority, and so well, that's an easy target to begin with, but then they're the minority that has the temerity to be successful. And that really brings the resentful out of the rat holes. And I've seen a rise in anti-Semitism online over the last three years that's just stunning to behold, on the right and on the left, but jointly. And then, well, so I was sickened by it, but then I was also immediately suspicious of Iran's role. And I mean, that doesn't require any particular perspicacity on my part. I think it's quite obvious, but, but I, that also opens up the, the rat's nest of, of the maneuvering, the political maneuvering around the Abraham Accords. Because, you know, I was very ill when the Abraham Accords were signed and I couldn't or hadn't paid much attention. And when I sort of recovered my ability to see again, I saw that this remarkable peace process had taken place and I could not understand for the life of me why it wasn't trumpeted on the front page of every newspaper across the world. And I also think that Trump's team should have got a Nobel Peace Prize for it. I, I cannot see how you could possibly make a counter argument to that for all of Trump's flaws and for his administration's flaws. This was a major accomplishment and yet, and I know the Saudis were behind it. You know, they didn't sign it, but it wouldn't have gone forward without their nod and wink. And I know, I believe, that if Biden would have taken the opportunity and been a bit magnanimous in his response to Trump, which he could have been, instead of thinking of him as Satan himself, that he could have enticed the Saudis into a peace accord. And we wouldn't be in this damn situation now. And now we're playing it out the hard way, you know, because the Iranians could win the propaganda war, and they've got, God only knows how many agents they have in the West, you know, promoting the kind of social upheaval that we've seen on the streets in the last few weeks. And so the narrative could go either way, but I'm rooting hard for the, for the Abraham Accords signees, and I hope they have the courage of their convictions, and I hope they can see that their way forward is the most appropriate way forward for the good of the Muslim world. Or what, are we going to stay in some 14th century conflict between the fundamentalist Muslim world and the, and the Jews? Jesus, that sounds, you know, we've had enough of that, haven't we? You'd think. I asked Ben Shapiro, what, what is the proportionate response to what happened on October oh, the 7th? Yeah. And he said, there isn't one, that there is yeah. no proportionate response and there shouldn't be. Uh, I mean, that in itself, you know, I asked Vivek Ramaswamy uh, when I interviewed him at the weekend, the same question, and he was basically inferring the same, but he also said that, um, you know, he would happily put the heads of a hundred Hamas leaders on stakes along mm -hmm. the border as a message mm -hmm. to people uh, not to commit this act. I thought that was a, a sort of medieval barbaric response to med medieval barbarism and mm -hmm. that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is not the solution. I also mm -hmm. believe that Israel has a fundamental right not just to defend itself after what happened, but has a duty to protect its people. And it has to take that duty obviously very seriously. But if, you're, if your mission statement, as they've made clear, is to eliminate Hamas completely, and Hamas live in, the, in Gaza surrounded by civilians, among civilians, you can only do that. You can only get rid of Hamas with massive civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where I have this moral quandary about mm -hmm. how much is too much. Well, it, d it, does Israel get a license to do whatever it wants to eliminate Hamas? Or should there be a limit? And if so, what is that limit? Well, I don't think Israel will have a license to do whatever it wants, because what will happen inevitably, and I, I think if I was an Iranian propagandist, I would be counting on this. Let's imagine that Israel moves against Hamas with its usual effectiveness. And they start winning, you know, in a serious way, and the casualties mount. Well, it's a lot easier to take a victim appreciation stance against a power that's clearly winning. So Israel can't win without accruing losses along the way, because the more they manifest their military superiority, the easier it's going to be for those who cast the Palestinians as victims to hold, to gain the moral upper hand. And so, and that doesn't mean I know what Israel should do, because I wish I had that wisdom. But what I would like to see happen, in the best of all possible worlds perhaps, would be for the signees of the Abraham Accords to say to Israel, privately first, 
we're not budging. And then maybe, and then maybe to take a foray into the public and say that, it would be lovely to see Saudi Arabia come out and say, you know, we're going to continue the Abraham Peace Accord process. And then Israel could say, well, if the Abraham Accord holds and we have the probability of expanding it, we can take the risk of not being so devastating in our response to Hamas, and they could back off, but because there'd be, there'd be a counter victory in it for them. And so as far, like, I can't see a better pathway forward than that, and I think that's a potentially realistic pathway, especially because that would also have the side benefit of not allowing Iran to prevail. So that's, as, that's the best I can do on, on how this might proceed in the, in the most optimistic possible way. And on, I don't know on, if that's good enough or not. On October the 7th, you tweeted, give them hell, Netanyahu, enough yep. is enough. And you got some blowback for that, as everybody yeah, a lot. says anything about this. Were you surprised yeah. by the scale of the blowback? Do you wish you'd phrased that tweet differently? Do you have any regrets about it? Well, that? you know, Twitter is a very complicated social media platform, and it's been difficult for me to learn how to use it wisely. And I'm not alone in that, because it's difficult to be wise on Twitter. Now, what I'm trying to learn is when a tweet is appropriate and when a long-form commentary is appropriate. And the rule, I think, is something like the higher the stakes, the more likely that the long-form commentary is necessary. And really, it would have been better had I, because I did release a YouTube video where I explained some of what we already talked yes, about. My sense it, yeah. that, yeah, yeah, and that was, well, that was received much better, let's put it mm. that way, but it also gave me a chance to elaborate my argument. And so what it highlighted for me, and I felt, you know, I was, look, I wasn't, I was very taken aback by what happened in, in Israel. And I was also, appalled because in my estimation it was unnecessary. As I said, the Abraham Accords could have been extended earlier and maybe this wouldn't have been necessary. Um, and so I, I, I allowed myself to express some sentiment at that point without providing context and that wasn't as good as providing the context. And so, and I'm rethinking Twitter overall at the moment about how to use it. You know, Elon has taken off the character limit and he's also made it possible to distribute video. And so it no longer has to be a place where impulsive exchanges can, can occur rapidly. And I'm trying to reconfigure how I use it. I'm much happier with the video. Now, you know, I was upset because I had developed somewhat of a Muslim following. Um, on YouTube, and I was very happy about that. A lot of people on the Islamic side of the world were watching my biblical lectures, for example, and you know, and I've had extensive conversations with Muslims on my YouTube channel, and you know, I burnt some of that up, and I'm not sure I did that. Well, I, I would say I'm certain I didn't do that in the most productive manner, and so do I regret it? It would have been better to do the long form, to, to have done the long form to begin with, you know? And Twitter invites and rewards a certain amount of impulsivity, and it wasn't... I don't know, Pierce, I don't know if it's ever time for impulsive action, especially when the stakes are serious, you know? Yeah, and so, no, I, I, yeah. I completely get that. I, was, I mean, there's no doubt, for example, that what happened October the 7th was a form of hell for the victims uh, and for their families. Um, there's also no doubt that for many living in Gaza, for many innocent Palestinians, it's, as we know, of the two million or so uh, residents and citizens there, they, uh, I think it's more than half are of child age, mm -hmm. and many are very young children, and many children are getting killed. And as a father, I'm sure, as uh, uh, like me, as a father, it is utterly heartbreaking to see so many mm -hmm. thousands of children being killed 
who have nothing obviously to do with this. Uh, again, this, this comes back to this moral quandary I have. Um, you know, it's interesting when you said enough is enough in that tweet, you know, some people are already saying, even if they're very sympathetic to Israel's need to take out Hamas, they're looking at these fairly apocalyptic scenes in Gaza and thinking enough is enough of that. You yeah. know, in other words, the, this, the, the revenge is already far greater in terms of death toll than the original appalling terror attacks. That, yeah, well, again, I guess is where the, I have a moral quandary. Well, the, the question is, I suppose, and I don't purport to have an answer to this, is the most effective way of combating Hamas military? And part of the answer to that is, is the military eradication of Hamas even possible? Because as I said, and we can see it unfolding in real time, as Israel's more successful militarily and the casualties mount, the resistance to what they're doing is going to grow. Yeah. And so even if they could take out Hamas militarily, which isn't obvious given its interpenetration with the civilian population, it, all of what's going to be played out is going to be played out on the military front. And we can see that in the rising tide, let's say, of demonstrations around the Western world. And I would say those demonstrations are likely to get larger and more effective in precise proportion to Israel's success on the military side. And so then I would think, well, is there another way of restraining Hamas? And well, that's again, that brings us back to the Abraham Accords because they were the most promising thing that's happened in seven decades. You know, and I think it's, it's easy to underestimate what a miracle they were. The people who formulated the Abraham Accords had to fight the State Department. They tried to introduce it under Obama to begin with, right? The notion was, well, maybe we could we could start the peace process with Israel without putting the Palestinians first. And that had been off the table conceptually in the State Department, as far as I've been informed, forever. And, and then it was proposed during the Obama era and it was rejected. And then it was proposed during the beginning of the Trump era and rejected, but eventually they, they carried the day. And then they did do an end run. And I think that actually put I think that was actually good for, for the typical Palestinian because it put a tremendous amount of a pre pressure on the Palestinian authorities who are basically tyrants who are more than willing to use their own citizens as cannon fodder. It put a lot of pressure on them to actually do something moving, moving towards a genuine peace, which is why now Iran, that's why Iran is so desperate to scuttling the accords, of I course. think. Of course. You know? So I think the way through Ham Hamas, all things considered in the medium to long run is to desperately extend the Abraham Accords as rapidly as possible. That's not a military victory, but you know, when, when you it's look easy to do this from when, the armchair. When you look at the full history of this conflict, the seven decades of, of, of conflict between Israel and, and the Palestinians, Jonathan Friedland is a, is a very good, uh, respected Jewish journalist uh, for The Guardian in the UK. He wrote a very interesting column the other day saying, you know, you could argue that both sides have a just cause here. Mm -hmm. And he said that as a leading Jewish commentator, that historically both sides have a just cause and that it's important to remember that. And that's why passions run so high. It's why people care so much. And it's why racing to take sides uh, is a mistake in this conflict. What do you think of that? Well, I think that, you know, if there wasn't a lot to be said on both sides, then the conflict wouldn't drag on forever and be unresolvable. You know, I think at some point you do something like cut the Gordian knot, which I do think to some degree the Abraham Accords had begun to do. Yeah. You know, I think it's, I don't think Israel's going away, but I don't think the Palestine, Palestine, Palestine isn't going away either. Mm. And so those things have to be accepted. I, it looks to me like they have to be accepted as on the ground realities. Now, the, the problem I've seen continually, I don't know, is that it's been convenient to use the Palestinians as an irritant to Israel in the West. And so the Palestinians have been held hostage. You know, the people who portray them as innocent victims presume that the Palestinians have been held hostage by the Jews, let's say, 
But I would say the Palestinians have been held hostage even more effectively by their own leadership and by those who are perfectly will willing to use them as the front man, the expendable front man to irritate Israel in the West. Well, you can't get peace under those circumstances. You know, and so Palestine is a reality that isn't going to go away, and Israel's a reality that isn't going to go away, and the Abraham Accords started to recognize that, and there was move in the right direction, and if that falls apart, we're going to be back to where we were yeah. 15 I mean, years the, ago, except worse. The, the interesting moment for me came when Israel turned off the power and the water. Um, they just were able to do that to two million people in Gaza. They could turn off the internet. And it struck me that that was a very vivid reminder that Israel effectively controls Gaza. It doesn't do so politically, but it does in reality. And that for many young people in Gaza, they know this, and they do feel that they've been living in a perpetual prison camp where their movement is controlled, where their access to basic things like water and energy and so on is controlled. Uh, and that in, until they get the freedom that they crave, this can never get resolved. Well, but I also you know, understand on the other side that the Israelis feel, how can we give freedom to a place that is run by a terror group who are literally committed to the eradication of not only Israel, but all Jewish people? Well, you laid out, you laid out what are the two sets of valid counterclaims. I mean, there's another complicating factor too. You know, you, you said that you, you know, your moral back is up because of the continual toll in civilians in Palestine, especially among people who, let's say, weren't even born when they first came to power. Mm. And so it's very difficult to look at that and see it as anything but unjust. But then it begs a whole other set of questions too, doesn't it? It's like, well, if your government is a totalitarian band of armed criminal thugs, what responsibility do you bear for that as, as the subjected people? And, you know, it's not like I know the answer to that. But, you know, I see in my own country in Canada that things are slipping and sliding in all sorts of pathological directions and people are letting it happen. And if you let that happen long enough, well, things get very, very bad. And they have got very, very bad in Palestine. And the answer to whatever tyranny Israel might be exerting over the Palestinians isn't for the Palestinians to exert even more tyranny over themselves, especially not in concert with a third party like Iran, who's perfectly willing to sacrifice them at any point. And so now, and then that question emerges, well, what responsibility do the Palestinians bear? Well, then I think we start to touch on more metaphysical issues. It's like, well, the Palestinians, like all people, bear the responsibility to live in truth and to stand up to tyranny in their, in their deeds, their attention and their deeds and their actions. Because if you don't, you pay for that, and so do your children, right? And then so do your grandchildren, and so do your great-grandchildren. And You know, there seems to be something unjust in that, in that why did the children suffer? And the biblical answer to that has always been, well, the children suffer for the sins of their forefathers. And you might think, well, it's pretty unfair that the world is set up that way. It's like, hey, it might be unfair, but it is set up that way, and it does beg the question. What responsibility do the people who are living under the thumb of totalitarians have for the fact that they're living under the thumb of totalitarians? And the answer isn't none. So this is why I'm a psychologist, not a politician. I no, say, no, but I think it's a really interesting question. It's also an interesting question. Why, why won't Arab states around Gaza take in Palestinian refugees? I mean, these are legitimate right. questions. Right. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of chain and saber rattling about how tyrannical Israel is. And of course, they're held to a very higher moral standard. But, you know, the prison that is Palestine has walls on sides that aren't Israeli. So and that no one is certainly not the progressives will never talk about that. And that's partly because, you know, all the oppressed people are equally morally virtuous. And so the fact that the Arabs won't take in the Palestinians, you can't even bring that up because 
course, the Arabs themselves are victims of Western colonialism, which is, you know, one of the most absurd propositions ever set forth by anyone about anything, but, you know, here we are. And it is quite a miracle in some ways that that the, the multidimensional fact of Palestinian enslavement isn't discussed in a much more forthright manner. There's many people are building the walls that, that make Palestine into whatever prison it is. And perhaps the Israelis are playing their role, but they're by no means the only actors. Let's talk about the response of progressives, and in particular, what's happening on student campuses, mm -hmm. particularly in America. You know, I've been struck by, by two things. One, the horrifying immediate response, not just in America, but when you saw <clears throat> mobs in Sydney, Australia, chanting, gas the Jews, when you saw huge protests by the Israeli embassy in Kensington and West London, near where I live, um, all celebrating. This is all within hours of what happened on October the 7th. You saw similar scenes in America. Um, so the gut reaction of many young people appeared to be to be celebrating what had happened. And you even had some, there was a Cornell uh, professor who w you know, was heard in public saying how exhilarated he was mm -hmm. by what happened mm -hmm. and still mm -hmm. hasn't been fired. Um, and these mm -hmm. are people who've driven this cancel culture for many years now, where if you use the wrong pronoun, they want you eradicated, fired, shamed, abused, and so on. Um, but here, if you celebrate the actions of a terrorist organization and killing 1,500 people, you actually don't lose your job. Students mm -hmm. who beamed pro-Hamas rhetoric onto the building at George Washington University, they haven't lost their places at that university. Mm -hmm. So even for the most heinous possible thing that you could do, which might warrant cancellation, the people who've driven cancel culture spare themselves. Well, this shows you how shallow the oppressor, oppress, oppression, oppressor narrative really is, oppressed oppressor narrative really is. You know, George Orwell famously said that the typical middle class socialist didn't love the poor, they just hated the rich. And I think the oppressor, oppressed narrative gives people moral license to identify the oppressor and to hate them resentfully with a good conscience. Plus, it's also extremely simple-minded, you know, and this is one of the problems with, with what's being taught in universities and even much more broadly than that now. The notion is we can view all human social relations and the past itself through a meta-Marxist narrative that proclaims that there are only oppressors and victims and that all you have to do to be moral is to be on the side of the victim. Now, the shadow side of that is that once you proclaim your moral superiority and you're on the side of the victim, well, number one, you don't have to think anymore. You just have to identify the two sets of players. And number two, number two, you're moral without effort because all you have to do is feel sorry for the victims. And then consequence number three is the oppressor being intrinsically evil can be the target of everything that's resentful and bitter and absolutely dreadful about you. Now, that's the standard narrative that's being taught on university campuses, and the Palestinians play the role of victim. And so you can't argue against the Palestinian cause, let's say, if, if you were inclined to, without simultaneously having to face the weight of every single person who's adopted the oppressor-oppressed narrative, upending that, and there's no way the university, not in the, not, it's not in the state they're in now, there's no way that's going to fly. And so, and so we see exactly what happened. The, the narrative's already in place. All oppressed people are innocent and virtuous victims. Well, so then when something like this happens and you see the Palestinian victims rise up against their evil Jewish overlords, then it's time for celebration. You know, and we forget entirely that the evil Jewish overlord story was the same story that the Germans used so successfully. And we also forget, and this is very interesting in relationship to Iran, I was reading a book by Stefan Zweig yesterday about turn of the century Vienna, just at the end of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and the dawning of the movements that eventually morphed into Nazism in Germany. And one of the things Zweig pointed out was that, you know, if you're a corrupt, oppressing psychopath, 
who's hell-bent on exploiting the population, and you want to deflect that, the Jews make a constant positive universal target, right? Because they tend to be disproportionately successful. And you can just say, well, you know, I'm not the oppressor here. It's those successful Jews. And that's being played out now. That's, that's, that's the guise, that's the disguise of left-wing anti-Semitism. I mean, it's a terrifying... We don't hate the Jews, we just love their enemies. Right, I mean, the, 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 the anti-Semitic response in the last three weeks has been actually quite terrifying to watch. I've got Jewish friends who are literally living in real fear now, um, yeah. some of whom were in Israel at the time and thought, well, the world will rally behind us and actually very quickly realized that they, in many cases that wasn't the case. In fact, the complete opposite. Uh, and when you saw these scenes in Dagestan at the airport with a mob literally charging around trying to find any Jewish passengers they could find, and it was, I mean, horrendous, but also if you're Jewish, this is utterly terrifying and must take you right back to Nazi Germany, World War II, the Holocaust, this never again, it, it is beginning to happen again. Well, I think we could be heartened in that regard by the counter position though too. I mean, I would say the, the reasonable majority in the Western world didn't take that stance still and quite forthrightly, I mean, even my prime minister, Justin Trudeau, who virtually never says a true word in his life or makes a, his, his actions are concatenations of false gestures even. You know, he was, he came out with a pretty forthright statement um, decrying what had happened on the Hamas side. And that has characterized the leadership of the West in general. And so I can certainly understand why the, the tiny minority of Jews that do exist in the world are terrified about what's happening. You know, it, it, there's, there's no reason for catastrophic alarm. It's, you, you know what I mean? It, it doesn't look to me like this is going to spiral out of control. And I'm not even so certain that in the medium to long run, it's going to be the worst possible thing. Because you know, too, the other thing that happened is that a lot of the false moral disguise of the progressive types was exposed in a radical way in the last few weeks. I mean, mm -hmm. Harvard, for example, just took yeah. a beating. You know, I mean, first of all, Harvard was ranked dead last by fire in terms of its support for free speech. And then it was 32 different Harvard groups came out essentially in support of Hamas. Yeah. And then a whole variety of CEOs said they wouldn't accept a Harvard degree as a hiring criteria. And Larry Summers came out and said, you know, the previous president of Harvard, that the institution had become so corrupt that it wasn't salvageable. And then, you know, the White House press secretary decried the actions of the squad who were supporting the Hamas protests. You know, so we're seeing cracks on the progressive side because of this that haven't been evident before. You know, and, and Biden himself came out and talked about how important it was to push forward with the Abraham Accords, which was something, you know, I wish he would have done two years ago, but better late than never. So I can understand why there's tremendous fear and uncertainty, but I certainly wouldn't say that all the news is bad. Let's talk about social media for a moment. We, there's no doubt that the kind of tribalism that we see in modern society fueled by social media has probably never been worse than I've seen it in the last three weeks. A constant barrage of uh -huh. often completely fake imagery, videos, claims, counterclaims from both sides. Um, but it's just a barrage. You know, I've been really quite shocked by just the scale of it and how little mm -hmm. of it appears to even have a semblance of, of truth about mm -hmm. it. What, well, do we do, what do we do about this? Oh, well, that highlights, that highlights a, a, a very pronounced danger. So, you know, in the last 15 years, we've erected virtual perceptual systems and virtual systems, virtual systems of representing reality. Now, if your system of representing reality is not in accord with reality, you're delusional. And right, technically, that's what a delusion is. And you're going to run into trouble when you try to act in your fantasy and run into the world. Well, these virtual worlds that we've erected on top of the real world don't run by the same principles as the real world. 
and that makes them delusional. And that delusional element is affecting us very badly in a couple of ways. I just heard Jonathan Haidt this morning talk about some of the re research he's reviewing in his new book. He shows very clearly that young liberal women, the probability that a young liberal woman who saturates her life with social media has a mental illness is more than 50%. That's wow. how bad it's got. Yeah, it's really bad. But that's not the only thing that's going on. You see, the other thing I've been watching, and this is really quite frightening to me, is that the problem with online, one of the problems with online communication is it disinhibits the narcissists and the psychopaths. And the reason for that is that they can circumvent the normal control systems that obtain in face-to-face -face interaction. Yes. You know, and in face-to-face -face interaction, there's things you will not say or do because you will be held responsible, and maybe immediately. You can say whatever the hell you want online, and you can get away with it too, and maybe even be rewarded for it. And so we have, so you just think about the amount of criminality and quasi-criminality online. 35% of internet traffic is pornographic. And it isn't nice guys that are running that. Let's put it that way. There's an immense amount of online criminality. Like most people are targeted by online criminals on a pretty regular basis. And then we just have the run of the mill narcissistic psychopaths who generate anonymous troll demon accounts who, who are spreading misery and sadistic hate as fast as they possibly can. And there's no barriers whatsoever to them doing that. And so then when something does happen that's contentious, let's say, the sadistic psychopaths just make hay out of that, right? They're spreading their misery as rapidly as they possible, possibly can for the lulls and the lulzes and to delight in other people's suffering. And the social media companies are naive enough not to regulate that. Now, regulating it's difficult, but, but it's a conversation we have to have, Pierce, because I yeah. think, like, if we let the psychopaths, that's 4% of the population, whenever they get the upper hand, and that happens from time to time, everything burns. I also and think I, that young, young people in particular, um, they are exposed to such relentless dopamine imagery, mm -hmm. both still pictures, videos, whatever. Um, and in particular, the last three weeks, if you're a young person with an impressionable mind and you're getting bombarded with some of the worst imagery imaginable, you know, babies dead, um, limbless and so on, if you're getting that on your feed all day long, which I'm seeing on mine, so they must be, it can only have an incredibly damaging effect to, to a, I think, a young generation already ripped with anxiety, ripped with problems about how to deal with the real world. And I think a lot of it is they're just seeing so much bad stuff all the time on social media, which when I was young, you just couldn't see it. You would not be able to access this kind of thing. You were protected in a way, yeah, from well, the reality of things like warfare um, yeah. and protected from this kind of imagery. Yeah, well, again, it's, it's a problem of technological revolution because this new sensory system that we've produced, this new system of perception, it's a fire hose, first of all, that's impossible to govern. You can never get on top of it. It's, it's infinite in its scope. Yeah. And then it allows the pathological and the terrible to spread as rapidly as the beneficial and the good. And so it is overwhelming. It's not just kids that have a hard time with that. I mean, it's just these technologies, well, what do we expect? They're insanely powerful and remarkable, but they carry with it the, well, they carry with it all of the implications of that insane power on the pathological side. And yeah. we don't exactly know how to deal with it. We don't know how to, reg we haven't evolved the social norms even that regulate online conduct you know i mean when i block people on twitter let's say i have qualms about it you know well i'm in favor of free speech mm -hmm. do i block trolls online and when exactly do i block them you know i've got more direct about that i have a couple of rules you know if you're anonymous if you're anonymous and you're annoying it's like yeah. you're done as far as i'm concerned but but that's just the beginnings of the evolution of anything approximating social But aren't social you just norms. saying, I mean, I've, I've wrestled with that because I've blocked, I think, 11,000 people or whatever it is. I can't <laughs> remember what the latest tally is. Um, I go on little block spurges sometimes. But to me, there's no contradiction between uh, believing passionately in free speech, but also allowing yourself not to have to listen to it. You don't have to listen to what people 
are saying to you. Well, you, ha you have the right in a, in a free democratic society to say, look, you're entitled to say whatever you want, but I don't actually have to listen to it. That's not you're not preventing them from exercising their right to free speech. You're just saying, I don't want to hear it. Um, well, that's sorry. why that's why we have walls. Like that, that's right. a good example of the difference between the virtual world and the real world. I mean, right. You have a house and it has walls and a door. And mm. the reason for that is you don't want a random stranger to come in and just yell things at you whenever. Right. You know, and so what are the walls and the doors on social media? Well, we have no idea because we thought, well, we'll democratize the public square. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that any narcissistic psychopath anywhere can say whatever they want to you and everyone you know. Well, you know, that's just not going to work. It's not going to work. There's always been criminals and quasi-criminals and troublemakers, and we have some mechanisms of regulation in the actual world and virtually no rec mechanisms of regulation whatsoever on the vir in the virtual world. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a tremendous problem. And it, it is also making it more and more difficult for us to distinguish what's real from what's not real because you don't know when you're being played for a, what would you call, masochistic fool by a sadistic psychopath. And the answer to that is often, often, yeah. you know, frighteningly often. And so my sense, like I've, I've proposed this before, is like I don't, I think social media... Um, enterprises above a certain size should separate people with verified identities, verified by their site, not with some universal digital ID, separate them from the anonymous types. Mm -hmm. Like if the anonymous types want to post, no problem, but they shouldn't get to post with the actual human beings. Because there's no responsibility, you know, and then you say, well, you know, maybe I'm a whistleblower and I'm, I'm standing for truth and I don't want to bear an undue responsibility for telling truth to power. It's like my sense online is for every one whistleblower who's genuine, who's anonymous, there's 999 anonymous troll yes. demons who are sadistic, right? Yeah. That's not a good ratio. You interviewed uh, Bibi Netanyahu quite recently, actually, a few months ago. Um, a lot of pressure on him internally, a lot of criticism. Uh, Hamas released a video uh, on Monday of some of the hostages attacking uh, Netanyahu's administration for, for not having a ceasefire and so on. That was clear propaganda. But it also reflects what a lot of people in Israel feel about Netanyahu and the catastrophic failure of security and defense on October the 7th. He's resolutely refused to accept any responsibility or to apologize for that. Do you think he should? Well, I, I guess I wouldn't presume to know. I mean, my observation about that was that, you know, people said, well, how could this happen? How could the Israeli defense systems be that porous? And I would say, our defense systems are way more porous than anybody would ever want to think. You know, it's very, very difficult to stop people who are willing to light themselves on fire to singe you. And any random person in a civilized society can cause an unbelievable amount of mayhem and trouble. And in order to forestall that possibility completely, which would be impossible in any case, we'd have to move towards a surveillance state like China where we're being monitored 100% of the time and then the bloody cure would be worse than the disease. It doesn't surprise me that Israel's defense was that porous. I don't think it I don't think it cannot be in a society that's still vaguely free. And even if you lock people down, Jesus, you can still cause a lot of trouble if you're hell-bent on doing it. So does Net should Netanyahu apologize for the failures of the Israeli defense system in relationship to the Hamas attack? I don't know enough to say. It isn't obvious to me that it failed any worse than you should expect a system like that to fail when it's faced by psychopathic terrorists who are being funded by outside sources who want to do nothing else but cause misery and mayhem. So I interviewed Netanyahu partly because I wanted to talk to him because I was curious and I was also an admirer of his economic reforms, the economic reforms that I think did raise Israel to this position of, of pronounced economic power and entrepreneurial capacity that they now possess which also made them a more attractive partner
during the Abraham Accords because the Israelis had the possibility of offering to the Arabs the sharing of their technology and their entrepreneurial and managerial prowess. They had something to offer along with their you know, military strength. So I thought that was all to the good. I don't know enough about Netanyahu and about the intricacies of Israel politics. God, it's hard enough keeping track of my own country, you know, to, right. to dare to, to say anything more than that. I'm glad I'm not in his shoes. How about that? That's, you know, I can't imagine there's anything about that that's, that's anything other than abysmally difficult nonstop. So... Let's turn, Jordan, to the ARC conference. It's why you're in London and I'm actually in Los Angeles at the moment. Um, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship. This is your brainchild. A huge event. A lot of very interesting speakers from all around the world. Um, you've made it clear it's, it's driven by uh, a, a desire to be motivational rather than political. Explain that. Well, I, I've traveled all over the world and met hundreds of thousands of people. Um, in various ways and listened to them and watched them and sampled public sentiment to the degree I was capable and that was overwhelming as we've discussed before. I had no idea really, like I had a clinical practice and I was pretty damn familiar with a reasonable swath of the scope of human misery but I didn't understand how widespread the sense of demoralization had become especially among young people and and, and I got a real taste of that. And um, I'm tired of the zero-sum apocalyptic fear-mongering story. I don't buy it. I don't think any bit of it is useful. I think it's extremely convenient who want to use the crisis to accrue power to themselves. And I think that the leader who motivates with fear is a tyrant. And the leader might say, well, there's something to be afraid of. And I would say, yeah, there's always something to be afraid of. You know, and does the apocalypse lurk in the future? It's like, yes, that's always been the case. So what's Ark's premises? Well, there's two. One is you have a moral obligation to be optimistic about the future. That, and that's, that's a strange statement, right? Mm -hmm. And it's actually a statement of faith, because I would say, just as you have an obligation to be courageous about the challenges that confront you in the present, and, and just as that's the best way of dealing with those challenges, your default attitude towards the future should be, bring it on, we can handle it. And I would also say that if that is your default at attitude, you're much more likely to be successful in your dealings with the future. And one of the things I've learned about classic religious or metaphysical faith is that a tremendous proportion of that is the faith that is courage, right? The courage to confront the unknown in the future with standing up straight with shoulders back, right? With the presumption that despite our flaws, we're intrinsically good, despite the misery in the world, it's intrinsically good and that that's the relationship we should establish with it. So that's the first part of the arc motivational message. And the second part is that Part of the way that you face the future in a manner that makes of it the best it could be is to do that responsibly. To take responsibility for yourself, to put your life together, to tell the truth, to pursue high order aims, to take responsibility for your marital partner and vice versa, to do the same with your family, your local community, your town, your city, and that's your identity that nested social web of obligations. That's your identity. And, and also that the meaning in your life is going to emerge as a consequence of shouldering that responsibility. The meaning and the adventure in your life. And so confront the future with faith and courage and accept the responsibility that's commensurate with that. And that's the way you set the world straight. And that's not a political solution. That's a spiritual solution or a psychological solution. Now, it has political ramifications, but we're much more interested at ARC and at the ARC conference with the, with the underlying substrate, the substrate about which the culture war is really raging, right? About the, the ultimate nature of reality in some, in some way and, and how, you, uh, how you construe that. I think to some degree you have to construe it as a matter of faith, eh? because we're all ignorant and limited in our knowledge, and so we have to make 
first pass approximations at what we're going to presume to be true. And so one set of presumptions is open your eyes, confront what frightens you, move forward stalwartly, aim up, tell the truth. There's no evidence that that's correct, but you can start with that as a set of propositions. And then you could also make the claim, you, the claim, and I think this is a valid claim, you cannot be armed better in life other than with that set of propositions. And I think that's the Western claim. And that's what we're trying to communicate to the degree we can with this art conference. Well, I think it's an excellent, uh, an excellent start. I mean, no more than that. Let's see how people respond to it. I was encouraged, actually, uh, in the last few days by the news breaking here in Hollywood that Disney have decided to put back the release of their new version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves by a year, following the huge backlash to the fact that actually it, as it wasn't going to have any dwarves in it, I think one. The rest were going to be fully bodied people, male, female, black, white, so on and so on, ticking every possible virtue signaling box. And I actually interviewed one of the leading dwarf actors in the world who said, how dare they put me out of work like this? This is one of the most prized jobs in the world for any dwarf actor being in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And it was a very good point, of course, that in their surge towards supposed equality, they were actually stopping the very people for whom this would have been the number one gig in town from getting that gig. But they've now put it back and apparently are going to go back to potentially even using CGI actual dwarves in the movie, which seems to me a significant climb down by Disney. What do you make of this? Well, I think it's actually, it's perversely analogous to the case that we're trying to make at ARC. So there is an underlying metaphysical or narrative reality. And you can warp and bend that with an ideology, but the ideology doesn't map well onto the underlying reality. And so th that, that's, and, and so how would that play out in the case of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? Well, that's a very old story. And some, some folk tales, we have anthropological evidence that some folk tales can be up to 10, 15,000 years old, extremely old. Well, there's a reason that they lay themselves out the way they do. It's, it's, the, it's the logic of the narrative world. So I can give an example with Snow White. Well, why is Snow White surrounded by dwarves when she reaches the peak of her beauty? Why is she surrounded by dwarves? Why do they have to be dwarves? And the answer is, a stellar young woman finds herself surrounded by dwarves. Right, that's the, universal, that's the universal position of an extremely well put together young woman. There's gonna be men around her who aren't what they could be, right? They're much smaller than they need to be. And why is she waiting for a prince? Well, because she's a princess. That's why, and so you're gonna be waiting. And this is the eternal situation of women. They're, they're gonna be waiting for not only their match, but for maybe for someone that they actually admire. And that's not to be found around the dwarves. Now, you can't just take that and say, well, let's throw some random diversity people in there. It's like the story has a coherence. And the coherence transcends easy understanding. You know, it wouldn't have that magical, mythical element that fairy tales have if, if the narrative didn't transcend the understanding. One of the things we're trying to do with ARC is to remind people that our civilization exists in a metaphysic, in a story. Right? It's a divine story, and that the divine story has its reasons, the reasons that transcend reason. It's, it's where Carl Jung, the, the famous psychoanalyst, he, he, his notion of the way the world worked, in, 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 to simplify it to some degree, is there are things that are absolutely beyond our comprehension. And then there are things that we understand explicitly and in detail. But there's a border between them. So, so imagine, there's not a cutoff line, so you go from things you understand completely to things you understand not at all. The border is the land of the dream, the land of the story, the land of the fantasy, the land of myth. It's half unknown and mysterious, like the lands in the Lord of the Rings, and it's half explicit and understandable. And it's the place that, that the unknown moves through before it becomes explicit. Our Western philosophical tradition, with its reliance on 
rights, let's say, and its insistence upon the dignity of each individual, exists within a dreamlike metaphysic. And that is the Judeo-Christian story. Now, we don't know what to make of that rationally, but it fills a gap. That, and if you tear it out or, or transform it into an ideology, all that happens is half-formed pathological fantasies take its place. And that's what's happening. Everyone sees this, you know, and Nietzsche predicted it in the late 1870s, thereabouts, you know. God will die and the realm of ideology will rise up to take its place. And if you think that Christianity or, or Judaism was superstitious and insane, it's like, just wait till you see what replaces it. <laughs> and so that's, well, exa that's exactly what we're seeing. And it's happening very, very rapidly. And everyone has that sense. This art conference, the press coverage has actually been quite interesting because even on the left wing side, I wouldn't say it's been laudatory on the left wing side, but it's been, it's been pretty even handed and neutral, which is quite remarkable. And the reason for that, I think, Pierce, is that people are so tired of the endless diet of nihilistic apocalypse yeah. that even those who don't, can't see their way out of it rationally hope that something else could be provided as an alternative. Dr. Jordan Peterson, uh, what a fascinating hour. Thank you very much indeed for joining me and best of luck with the, the conference. I think it's a great idea. It's a great thing to get people with good ideas together, even if they're bad ideas actually, just debate ideas um, and to have a positive theme of how we can make things better, not worse. Uh, get away from nihilism, get the opposite of nihilism into the ideology of the world would be a great starting block. So I thank you very yeah. much indeed. My pleasure. Yeah, well, it's good to know that it might be courage that's the opposite of nihilism. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Pierce.